at welcome to the Exeter Web Seminar on FMEDA Accurate Failure Rates. I'd like to just remind everyone that there is a question and answer tab at the top of your screen. Please do not hesitate to use this mechanism at any time to type any questions you may have. I will be glad to read and answer the questions as quickly as I spot them. This web seminar is being recorded and can be viewed in the future on the Exeter website. Today our subject is the Exeter FMEDA process, the means by which we can predict realistically accurate failure rate data for the process industries. My name is Bill Goble. I've been involved in uh, functional safety for over 25 years. I've been involved with a, uh, a product manufacturing company. And then uh, for the last 16 years, I've been with Exeter. A lot of my work has been in failure analysis and uh, FMEDA uh, derivation. I work for Exeter. Exeter is a global company with offices around the world. We have people who are former new product development team members, former safety certification company members, and we have a lot of people from the uh, end user community, uh, primarily from uh, petrochemical and chemical companies. It's a good mix. We argue a lot, and it's a good thing. Exeter does a lot of different work, from systems level consulting to product and personnel certification. We have an extensive database that we publish and uh, provide for people, and we have engineering tools on how to uh, engineering tools that help the safety life cycle. It looks like a lot of different things, but everything Exeter does is oriented toward automation system reliability availability, safety, and cybersecurity. I'm proud to say that Exeter has authored most of the industry references for automation, safety, and reliability. We've authored the data handbooks on equipment, failure rate data, and component failure rate data. We like our work to be made public and we sell them in terms of book forms as opposed to keeping them secret. Now today, of course, we're talking about the FMEDA method and uh, how it can generate realistically accurate failure rate data. But of course, the first question we have to ask is, why do you need failure rate data? One of the fundamental concepts in today's functional safety standards, 6.508, and its derivative works, is probabilistic analysis of any given safety function design. You can do probabilistic analysis only when you have failure rate data for all the products that are now installed or may be installed. Where do you get failure rate data? Where does one get failure rate data? Well, we have industry databases. Today, the ORITA, Offshore Reliability Equipment uh, Database Association, provides excellent data. Company groups get together and uh, voice their opinions about what numbers to use. Manufacturers can do field return data studies, which provides useful information but has uh, limitations in terms of the absolute failure rate there's a technique called the B10 data from ISO 13849, the machine safety standard, but it has some uh, severely limiting assumptions. The FMEDA technique, developed by engineers at Exeter uh, during the uh, 1990s, and end-user field failure data studies, which have the potential to uh, offer a great deal of good, if good data, uh, if we had a good quality data system in place. So I strongly recommend such things. Let's talk about each of these. What about these industry databases? Today, a lot of very useful data is provided by the Orita database, a consortium of offshore companies in the North Sea. The consortium is operated by DNV out of Norway. 
and all the data analysis that I have seen has been done by Syntef in Norway. It provides a lot of very useful information on process equipment. They publish a PDF data handbook, which has failure rates, failure modes, and common cause factor estimates for use in safety instrument and function verifications. It's kept relatively up to date with the most recent public release in 2010. And what I learned very importantly, all realistic failures are included. And that includes both failures due to the product design and manufacturing and failures due to site site um, operational procedures, including things like maintenance errors and um, exceptional stress. Not bad. Very useful piece of data. It was very clear to me after traveling to Norway and attending a safety a seminar where the subject of Orita versus FMEDA was debated that Orita felt very strongly that all real failures must be included in PFH and PFD average calculations in order to show realistic results. They mean both product-related failures like manufacturing defects, uh, design weaknesses, unexpected stress events that weren't anticipated by the designers, uh, failures of random support equipment, and site-specific failures like maintenance errors, testing and calibration errors, and exceptional uh, uh, unexpected high-stress events. According to the discussion that I was involved in in Norway, a number of people said all of these failures are included. And they should be. What about company and group? failure rate data estimates. Well, typically a group of experienced engineers share their memories of failure events and estimate failure rates. Of course, it's not a real scientific approach and results definitely vary on who's in the room and their specific experience, but the results can be valuable, especially for comparison purposes, and especially when it's used from more than one source. For example, a committee in Germany from the Nemour Chemical Industry Group published NE130, where they, for example, published failure rates for sensors, logic solvers, and final elements, and they published the dangerous uh, undetected failure rate uh, for a final element assembly of 400 fits. Interesting. I don't have any idea how they arrived at this data, but... It's a piece of data we can use to compare and gain information from. What about manufacturer field return data? The biggest problem with manufacturing field data is the manufacturers cannot be certain what percentage of actual failures are returned as part of a warranty return system. Manufacturers cannot definitely know how many field operating hours exist because um, they know shipping dates, but they don't know how long it takes to install an instrument, and they don't know if it's been sitting on a stockroom shelf or not. So there's a number of variables here, and I've seen some very optimistic calculations uh, done by uh, people in manufacturing companies, and I will admit that I was taught to do those optimistic calculations when I worked for a manufacturer. In spite of the fact I'm skeptical about using this as an absolute failure rate, I find that the data can be very valuable. That there's a lot of really useful information in this uh, data. And we should definitely include it in the input to us, any failure analysis system. What about B10 data? I don't know if you've even heard of this before, because it does come from machine safety, not process safety. But the B10 method uses cycle testing. And the concept is that a cycle test is done on a set of products. And it's typically, of course, then most useful for mechanical or electromechanical products. And you cycle them on and off and on and off as fast as you can 
and given a set of products, typically a number greater than 20, you run the test until 10%. Or if the test set was 20, until two of them fail. And the number of cycles until failure is called the B10 point. And that just means, well, the number of cycles, 10% fail. And so you convert the number of cycles to a time period by knowing the cycles per hour in any particular application. And you calculate a failure rate by dividing the time period by 10% of the failure count. Or two failures divided by the time period. And the dangerous failure rate is made versus safe by just assuming a 50-50 split between safe and dangerous. The problem with this method is that it assumes that all of the constant failure rate during the useful life is due to premature wear out, typically due to manufacturing defects uh, of, of product weaknesses. Because in the end, cycle testing was designed to predict the useful life of a mechanical product. So it's primarily used to predict useful life or wear out point. And it is interesting that someone thought that the method could be used to predict a constant failure rate, but the primary assumption is all other failure modes are completely insignificant compared to premature wear out. Now that's interesting, but not at all true for any product, any mechanical product, for example, in static motion. In fact, some failure modes become very significant when a product sits motionless for 100 hours. That's less than a week. If you're sitting there for four days, 24, 48, and, uh, yeah, four days, stiction begins to form. That can cause dangerous failure rates. B10 data would not apply. And so for generally speaking, while it can be used in high-speed machine safety applications, it's totally inappropriate for the process industries. So what about the FMEDA? FMEDA is a predictive con a failure concept that can be used on brand new designs based on the design strength. It was derived because gathering enough failure statistics at the product level has just not happened. Neither manufacturers nor end users nor engineering companies do a real good job of gathering up failure statistics. And if they do, the statistics aren't available until the product is obsolete. Think about the usefulness of that. Therefore, Given that we don't have enough failure statistics at the product level, where do we have failure statistics? Well, at the component level. So we break, break a design into its components and perform a detailed study of each component and how that component will affect a device, an instrument. Sounds simple enough. It's truly a study of design strength. It's a tedious process. Some people consider it a very boring process. Um, crazy people like myself enjoy this kind of work, but uh, not everyone does. Every single part, you review it and see how will this part, if this part fails in this mode, if this capacitor fails, open circuit, how does that impact the design? Does the device continue to operate? Does the device fail? And if it does fail, does it fail safe? Or does it fail dangerous? And if it does fail in one of those modes, can the diagnostics detect that failure? So using a component database that has failure rates and failure modes and useful life, the FMEDA product process then generates a product failure rate. Product failure modes and diagnostic coverage and even useful life. And using a component database, using a good component database, this, these numbers can be 
determined and predicted far more accurately than with only manufacturers' field data on previous products. The FMEDA process can generate very detailed results that can clearly distinguish between uh, different designs. Different designs of mechanical, electronic, and electromechanical devices. Of course, you can imagine the biggest negative of an FMEDA, and that's the component database. I've heard the term garbage in, garbage out for decades. And of course, the accuracy of the FMEDA itself depends on the accuracy of the component database. Therefore, it's very important that any component database be verified or what we might call calibrated. At Exeter, we have gathered over 100 billion unit operating hours of field data, primarily from the process industries. We compare this field failure data results to the FMEDA results on a product level. And we do it over and over and over again, hundreds of times. Every time there's some fundamental difference between the field failure data, even manufacturer's field failure data, and the FMEDA results, we have to explain the differences. Sometimes we discover components are being used differently than we anticipated, and we add a new component to our component failure database. Sometimes we discover that the field failure data collection system has some fundamental flaw, and we reanalyze the data based on excluding or including additional information. The key is it's a closed-loop feedback system, which over time has developed, a rel we believe, a relatively accurate uh, methodology for predicting future failure rates. It is important that this component database be made public, and Exodus sells this and makes it available to people. One of the primary reasons is so you can uh, criticize us. People have purchased our database and called up and said, you know, you have this component and this failure rate, and I think it's wrong. And we will talk to them, we will reconcile the differences and improve the database. FMEDAs, of course, depend on this component database, and not all, quote, FMEA slash FMEDA results are the same. Compare ball valve failure rates. We have some excellent numbers of 4.83 e to the minus 7 and 1.35 e to the minus 6. And the difference is the application. Is it a full stroke? application where you can tolerate leakage, or is it an application with tight shutoff? And I think most everyone would understand that the tight shutoff application has a higher failure rate because many of the potential degradation mechanisms of the seal will be a failure in the tight shutoff application. If I compare those to another um, set of failure rate numbers I saw published on the certificate uh, of a well-known German certification body, they had a number of 6.55 e to the minus 8. My goodness, that could be two orders of magnitude, or at least an order of magnitude too low. The problem with that, of course, it's dangerous. What about actuators? We have a couple accident numbers. A spring return rack and pinion actuator and a <clears throat> double-acting rack and pin actuator. You see the 4.29 e to the minus 7 and a 6.84 e to the minus 7. That's failures per hour. Another set of data uh, based on an FMEA quote made based on manufacturer's warranty data showed 8.54 e to the minus 9. My goodness, that's approaching two orders of magnitude too low. That's not good. If someone uses a particularly optimistic failure rate, they could be designing a system that is not safe enough. 
how do you know these numbers are no good? There's only one way to compare numbers with actual field failure returns. Not manufacturer's warranty data. The first thing we did at Exeter was we compared the FMEDA results to ORETA. And we did this primarily by attending a conference in Norway where this was the uh, subject of a debate. There were many engineers from the ORETA analysis team, an engineer from Exeter, and a number of end users in the audience. A public debate. It was very clear to me from listening to the debate and from participating in it that, in fact, ORETA included more than just product failures. ORETA included more than Exeter uses in an FMEDA. And when we started studying the numbers, we discovered that it kind of answered a question we had from years ago when um, some of our engineers did a field failure study where we looked at the failure rate from site to site and discovered the ratio was about a 4x. Why would that be? 4x difference in the failure rate of the same piece of equipment from site to site. Hmm. A service engineer went to that site, discovered some obvious systematic issues, and they were removed from the analysis. And then the ratio of the failure rate varied about 2x from site to site. And quite frankly, this was the same industry, the same company, operating under the alleged same procedures, and it's a highly, the, the, the environmental variables were almost identical from these two sites. Yet the failure rate was 2x difference. During the ARETA conference, it was very obvious to me that failures, that some of the failures, like half the failures that ARETA was using were site specific. So what we're talking about is the difference between these product failures and its causes and the site-specific failures like maintenance errors, testing, calibration errors, and so forth. The exit of view is, of course, that all real failures must be included in a realistic PFD calculation, but we model them differently. We use the term operational safety culture. We have a method created to evaluate the operational safety culture of a company. And then we use that model in our Excellentia tool uh, to adjust the failure rates as well as probabilities of successful repair, probabilities of successful proof test, and a number of other important variables that are impacted by site-specific policy. This more accurate way of modeling operational safety culture uh, gives credit to the people who are doing a good job and properly penalizes those who are not doing a good job rather than taking the average of all of them, which is what you get when you come up with a single failure rate. Now what about end user field failure data studies? Well, they represent a rich opportunity and wow! If we could get sufficient data recorded on a specific site and we could analyze it, we could probably come up with some really good failure rate information and we could identify even more variables that might be involved. The problem is insufficient information. But I would never turn down an opportunity to look at a field failure study and there's always very useful information in there. I would say Exeter is quite blessed to be able to have studied uh, several dozen uh, field failure studies from the chemical and petrochemical and offshore industries and one nuclear, which was really full of rich, valuable data. And we use that as input uh, to our system uh, to help make certain that our FMEDA results are reasonably accurate. We do have a lot of insufficient information, uh, like when is a failure report written? What's the definition of a failure? We had one site, for example, where I was able to 
uh, go with the maintenance technician as when, when proof testing was done, and the person would check the calibration of a sensor, and uh, if they were able to recalibrate, they would not mark it as a failure, even though the initial calibration might have been sufficiently out to have caused a dangerous failure in the safety function. Those should have been marked as failure, but they were not. So their particular data analysis came out much more optimistic than uh, Exeter because the as-found conditions were not properly recorded. Many times the operating conditions are not recorded. But things are getting better. There are absolutely field data collection standards available today from the ISO, from IEC, from LUMOR, and uh, even though it's not a standard, the AICAG Center for Chemical Process Safety has formed the Process Equipment Reliability Database Committee that have developed methods for collecting data, and these all indicate help and promise for the future. The other big thing that I see happening right now is the number of field data collection tools on the market. At Exeter, our tool is called Silstat, and uh, it's preloaded with taxonomies. You don't have to set it up. It's ready to go with a simplified pick list. And Exeter offers data analysis service using the Exeter predictive analytics technique. And the data output reports are compatible with PERG for those who want to uh, aggregate their data with other companies. All of this means to me, like we're going, means very simply, we have data, I'd like it to be better, it's going to be better. Let's take a look at the data we have though, and let's compare it to FMEDA data. First thing I want to look at is the Dow plant study. Dow has published a set of failure rate data, and I will say that the ex several Exeter engineers have traveled to Ternutsen, Netherlands, to speak with the Dow people, understand how the data was gathered, what was included in the data and what was not. We developed a pretty good understanding, and I thank them again uh, for their cooperation and assistance. Here's the Dow data. It's a gray circle. I'm going to drop that gray circle right on this bar along the bottom. Roughly speaking, 5e to the minus 7. That's the failure rate predicted for a pressure transmitter. Now let's take a look at some FMEDA results and drop the FMEDA results on the chart. That's not a bad match. And remember that Dow includes all types of pressure transmitters. Old designs, new designs, microcomputer based, uh, anal old analog transmitters and some safety transmitters. And it kind of looks like if we, I don't have the exact distribution of which kind of products are at or in the Dow study, but it appears to me like a, an average of all these different types comes in pretty close to the Dow number. And not a bad match. What about a Rita? We've read, we, we took the data from OLF 070, which comes from the PDS uh, database, 3 e to the minus 7, and if I divide that in half to account for site-specific data versus product-specific data, I will drop that on the chart. Now let's take a look at the dangerous failure rates, because uh, the ORETA data is only uh, covered is not the total failure rate, only the dangerous. Let's drop those FMEDA results, the light green circles onto the chart. Not a bad match. I think if we take an average again, you might discover that the uh, FMEDA results are pretty close. I did not. I do not have a distribution of exactly what specific types of equipment are, are part of the ORETA database. But in general, I was told that uh, most of the equipment were installed many years ago, and it's probably more, the population is probably dominated by some of the older instrument types, like the uh, 1151. 
This isn't a bad match. 1.5, half of this number, compared to 1.2, e to the minus 7. That's a pretty close match. That tells me, if anything, well, the, the FMEDA results are pretty, pretty, pretty accurate to a realistic end user. Field failure data and the exit of FMEDA data is well matched to a reader divided by two. We can compare mechanical parts as well as electronic. Here's some numbers for FMEDAs. We have for the poppet type solenoid valve and a spool type. FMEDA can distinguish between these two fundamentally different designs. If I compare the average of those two numbers, go ahead, get out your calculator. 1.59 plus 5.66, 6, 7, 7, 7, a little over 7, half of 7 is... 3.5, about the, that's, oh my goodness, that's very close to the Dow study. We definitely spoke to the Dow engineers and we were told that they include all types of solenoid valves, poppet, spool, all designs in this data, so it is a composite and we could take an average and gee, that, that tells me we're really, really close. Let's compare to Arita. Orita is 9, e to the minus 7. If I divide by 2, down here on the horizontal line, we get a 4.5. That's not bad. That's pretty close. Orita is a little higher than Dow, 3.5 versus 4.5, but they're not that far apart considering the, the uncertainty of failure rate data and the statistical collection techniques. We've also put on some published data from some of the certifications from a German certification body. And we see numbers like 8.59 e to the minus 9. And in one case, oh my goodness, 4.53 e to the minus 10. That's kind of like 7, 8. That's kind of like three orders of magnitude too low. That's not good. Even the manufacturer's warranty data, as optimistic as it is, isn't nearly as bad as minus 10. Anyway, we plot those results and we discover that the manufacturer's warranty-based data and the cycle test data are totally inappropriate for process industries and should never be used. Oh, I see a question coming in. I'll read the comment. Who am I? to challenge a number published by a reputable German certification body. Hmm. I can tell you who you are. You are the engineer responsible for safety verification of your plant or your customer's plant. You are the engineer responsible to make certain a design has enough risk reduction. It's your job to know and understand what are reasonable failure rates and what are not. And to reject numbers that are not reasonable for your application in the process industries. I think cycle test is just fine for machine safety, where a solenoid valve might be opening and closing every few seconds. But it's not fine for the process industry. You must look at every certificate, look at the data, try to determine the method used to generate that data, but most importantly, to compare that data with known reasonability limits. Let's check actuators. Here's the Dow actuator number, 2 e to the minus 7. I'll plot that 2 e to the minus 7 on the horizontal line below. We can also drop in the Nemour NE 130 number. They only publish a number for an entire final element. You remember 400. We'll put that down here on the bar. Let's take the Arita number and divide by 2. And we'll put that 
actually it's it's identical. These things kind of all pile on top of each other. Hmm. And let's take a look at some FMEDAs. One of the FMEDA numbers is exactly in line with the Nemour, Orita, and Dow. 4.29 versus 4, or 2. We have some numbers that are 6, 6.84, 6.29. If anything, it looks to me in this case as if the FMEDA numbers are a bit uh, pessimistic. We would better dig into that a little deeper and make sure the FMEDA results aren't too negative. How about vowels? I see another question coming in. Are operating conditions considered? Um, yes, to a certain extent. Uh, in the FMADA results, we have a number of seven different operational profiles, we call them, which list a whole series of environmental variables based on international standards. And the FMADA component data is published as a function of, of the operational variable. So for any given parts, we certainly would have seven different failure rates accounting for seven different operational profiles. Thanks for asking the question. More questions are welcome. Never a problem with that. Now let's take a look at valve data. First, let's get this Dow number. Dow publishes a number for a valve body. It is interesting that Dow separates the actuator from the valve. They have 1.4 e to the minus 6. Let's drop that on the line here below. All right. Where's our reader? It's 8 e to the minus 7. And if we take half of that, we'll publish a number that's 4 e to the minus 7. Boy, that's a lot. That's a lot lower than the and then the Dow number, I do not know why. One would have to dig into the specifics. Nemour has that uh, final element number, which is, I remember, yeah, final element number, which is a valve and an actuator. And so they've got the 4 e to the minus 7, which is exactly half. Now, let's take a look at these ball valves. Close to trip, tight shut off. 4.83. That's pretty close. That's pretty close to the FM uh, to the uh, Orita divide by two and the Nemour. Uh, and, it's, it, and there's another one where the uh, tight shutoff requirements generated a 1.35 e to the minus six, which is almost right on top of the Dow data. And I explained once before that. Um, the failure rate when tight shutoff requirements are present is much higher than when there is no tight shutoff. And FMEDAs can predict that difference. I think those numbers are pretty close. We don't know the exact application conditions. Um, I don't know if any of the offshore valves require tight shutoff or not. The experts I talk with tell me no... Uh, a, a small amount of leakage is, is easily tolerated, especially when you have a double block and bleed. Anyway, not a bad comparison. However, a number published by a German certification body is way below, like at least an order of magnitude, and that, that's that could be dangerous if someone designs and depends on these numbers to verify a safety design. These kind of comparisons are the things I'm talking about when I say compare the failure rates due to field data with the FMEDA results. At Exeter, we do this frequently. We use all the data we can get, manufacturer's warranty studies and user field failure studies, and we look for relative accuracy. We do our best to gather as much information as we can. I will tell you in the past year we have visited BASF, Dow, 
heat ponds, ExxonMobil upstream, ExxonMobil downstream, and uh, air products. We still have a number of other companies we're going to visit. We're looking for more failure rate data, and we're doing more comparisons. If we find problems, we will take action and explain the differences. That's how you get the FMEDA component database calibrated to produce realistic, accurate data. I conclude that in the process industries, ORITA is a valuable asset to all of us. And those companies that participate in this data aggregation effort uh, should be congratulated. Manufacturing warranty data is a source of valuable information, but not that useful for absolute failure rates. The B10 cycle test approach is just totally inappropriate for any process industry application. Fortunately, there's a lot of people still using it out there. Not good. I doubt those people would pass a CFSE exam, but the Exit FMEDA database is predictive, feed-forward kind of predictive to provide relatively accurate failure rate data about a product. But the FMEDA technique does not produce reliable failure rate data for site-specific failures, and as I said at Exit, we use a uh, operational safety culture approach for that. We're hoping for good and more quality site data. And I'm convinced we're going to get some as the new tools become more and more widespread. So in summary, I think the field failure data calibrated FMEDA results provide accurate failure rate data for process industries especially. FMEDA results can provide strong predictions for brand new products long before field failure results are available. FMEDA slash FMEDA, whatever the people call them, results based on manufacturer's warranty data are optimistic and should never be used to verify realistic operating conditions. And the operational safety culture should absolutely be included in random failure probability analysis. But such failure rates are not part of the product failure rate numbers. Try and remember that. If you're not using an Excellentia tool, I do recommend that you take the FMEDA results and multiply by two, since uh, several field failure studies have indicated that's an appropriate multiplier. If anyone has any questions or comments, I would very much appreciate hearing them. Any challenges, please go ahead and type in your question right now if you would like. Uh, if you think of a question later, please do not hesitate to send me an email. I'm going to type in my email address. There you go. If you think of a question tomorrow or even next week, send an email. I may take a little while to answer. We do have quite a queue, but we'll try to get to all your questions in a relatively reasonable period of time. Don't forget this web seminar is recorded and will be available on the Exeter website and on YouTube. I thank you for your attention today. I hope your time was well spent. Remember Exeter webinar Wednesdays. We have a lot of good, useful information to help people improve safety. Let me check one more time for any questions. I don't see any. All right, let me just say thank you and goodbye.